Yupiugut, Yukait good quick beat in Machpimsu. We are the Yupid, the Inuit of the great river deltas and the sea. Akatamani, in the old days, we lived by the seasons, the seasons of the game and the fish and the gathering. We gave festivals when the seasons came and went. We made stories and songs and dances about our lives. And for the dances, we made masks. The Yupit, the Yupik Eskimo people, of southwestern Alaska occupy the vast stretch of delta land poured into the Bering Sea by the Yukon and the Kuskokwim rivers. They are the heirs of a rich and varied culture, and their heirlooms, especially their masks, have found their way into the great museums and collections of the world. The masks are called kinakuk a thing to cover the face. They are carved of driftwood, painted with clays, and decorated with hoops and feathers. They represent men and animals, and creatures of the imagination, the unseen world, things known only in dreams or visions. Whatever a man might see in his mind's eye, whatever shape he could hold in his imagination, the adze and the curved knife could shape from driftwood. The masks might be funny or frightening or full of spirit, but they were always magic, the magic that comes of being able to exchange one face for another, to become, if only for the space of a dance, another person or another thing. Seen through the eyes of a mask, the world becomes a magical place. When the missionaries came, they looked at the masks without favor. It seemed to them that the masks were too much a part of the old world, the old beliefs. They saw the magic in masks not as a part of a people's spirit and imagination and art, but as superstition and idolatry. And so, little by little, as the people took up the new religion, they put the masks aside. In some places, even the dancing stopped. Everywhere, the people stop dancing with masks. There is a traditional Yupik story how the crane got his blue eyes. It tells how the crane, out picking berries one day, took his eyes out and set them aside to watch for danger. Someone stole the eyes and the blind crane had to pick blueberries and use them for eyes instead. That's what happened to the masks. Someone stole their eyes. Masks were still made by masters who remembered the great mask dances, but they were no longer made with eyes to see with. They were made as wall decorations and works of art, art for tourists and collectors. They no longer needed to follow the shape of a man's face to take the grip of a dancer's teeth. They no longer needed eyes to see with. Painted eyes would do. Sometimes, when a thing has lost its original purpose, it lives on as a model or a toy or a stylized representation. It comes to have new and different meanings. The old meanings are lost. Mass carving even evolved into a new art form, a kind of sculpture that strayed farther and farther from the original purpose. It was art and it had its own validity and its own purpose, but it was no longer mask making. That's how things came to be. The masks lost their eyes and fewer and fewer people remembered the magic in the Qazgiks when dancers could change their faces and sing the stories of another world. That's how it was until the fall of 1982, just before freeze-up in Bethel. Bethel is a small town on the Kuskokwim River, the trade and transportation hub of the Yupik world. People come to Bethel from more than 50 villages in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. They come to buy and sell, to go to the hospital or the college, to pick up cash at seasonal jobs. Bethel attracts people from all over the region, some looking for the new world, some bearing parts of the old one. 
Among them are the dancers and carvers who make up a loose-knit group known as the Bethel Native Dancers. The Bethel Native Dancers have been together for years and little by little they pull the strands of traditional culture together from all over the Delta. They are the keepers of the old dances and songs and the creators of new ones. They pass these on to any young people who will listen. The older dancers remember masks and they wanted to see them again. With the help of a grant from the Alaska State Council on the Arts, the Bethel Native Dancers embarked on a project to revive the use of masks in their dances. They had encouragement from artist Ron Sinangatuk, a teacher and specialist in Eskimo art. Among all Eskimo people in the world, this area had the most complex and most imaginative type of mask that was made by Eskimos. They were highly developed art pieces or the pieces that they interpret for their own use but we interpret as art pieces. They're very highly developed which are now world treasures in the museums. Sinangatak particularly stressed the importance of returning the mask maker's art to a community purpose. I'm really uh, excited to see that the masks, the mask project will take, will take off and go on just because you want to do it for yourselves. The Bethel Dancers commissioned traditional masks from three master carvers, Nick Charles Sr., Kay Hendrickson, and John Kosawiak, known locally as Uncle John. In the old days, the selection of masks for a ceremony was the province of Angaskuk, the shaman or magician. From dreams and visions, the shaman would describe the creatures of the spirit world or the animals and their yoa the human-like spirit that dwells within him. The shaman might carve the mask himself or describe his vision to a master carver who would interpret it for him. Kay Hendrickson remembers. Not everyone made masks back in those days. You wouldn't make a mask unless you were a shaman or unless a shaman asked you to make one. This time, the dancers, carvers, and elders met together to choose three masks and the dances to be performed with them. Although the Finnish masks are to be the property of the Bethel dancers, leader Dick Andrews reminds them that things weren't done that way in the past. These masks were only used once, and after the dance was over, they would give it away for a toy or etc. Indeed, many of the masks now found in museums were given away or sold after their one-time use in a dance. True dancing masks are too rare and too valuable these days to be discarded after one dance. The Bethel dancers will use them in a major performance and hopefully for years after. To ensure that the art itself will continue, the group brought in promising apprentices from regional villages to learn from the masters. And while the carvers set to work, the drummers, singers and dancers prepare for the performance. The material for the masks is driftwood gathered on the river banks and beaches. There are a few trees in this tundra world. The carvers select tough stumps, saw them into blocks, and hew them into shape with the ads. There are no drawings and no plans. Each carver holds the image of his creation in his mind's eye. If his vision is a strong one and he holds it firmly as he carves, it will emerge from the wood. For the apprentices, this is the time to watch. In this ancient system of teaching and learning, there is little explanation. The student asks few questions. Each motion of the master carver is minutely observed. When a step seems clear, it's time to try for yourself.
I began by making my own bows and arrows. My father didn't make them for me. Later, I realized that it takes hands-on experience to learn to use tools like these. There are no penalties for error. An apprentice learns by observation, by trial, and by making mistakes. A beginner would not be criticized for a mistake that might ruin an entire mask. The only failure is giving up. Patience is the first lesson of this art. I didn't get much instruction from my father or the other men. I learned the most by trying to make things for myself, remembering what I'd seen and how the work was done. It's not an easy way to learn, especially for students used to the Western way of education with explanations, answered questions, clearly outlined steps. Here, the student must use the Eskimo way of watching, the eye that captures every detail. By observing and then trying each step, the student discovers the process anew. There is room for error, but there's also room for innovation. In trying each step for himself, the apprentice may find a better way. My father used to say, you can't learn by doing nothing. You've got to make an effort. That way we learn. Once the basic shape of the mask has been hewn from the wood, most of the finer work is done with the curved knife the milchak. This handmade tool dates back centuries from the time when the first fragments of iron made their way from hand to hand across Siberia to the traders of the Bering Sea. With its short blade, the curved knife is a reminder of the days when iron was more prized than gold. Guided by the carver's thumb, the curved knife can be one of the most precise of tools a cutting edge, a gouge, and a plane all in one. In the hands of a novice, it seems a stubborn and dangerous thing. In the hands of a master carver, its razor-sharp edge is a point at which imagination becomes reality. In the old days, this work was done in the Qazgik, the communal house where men of the village ate, slept, made tools and equipment, and told stories. Those stories might be funny or serious, fanciful or historic, but they were at the heart of the Yupik educational system. From the stories heard in the Qazgiq, the young learn traditional wisdom and values, how a man should live, work, and hunt. The Qazgiq is no longer the center of a man's life, and education is now the province of the village school. The stories these men tell often hark back to more traditional times. We remember seeing our elders, the first generation. Everything then was made from wood, all the everyday implements. They made kayaks, fish traps, spears, spear throwers, oars, everything from wood. Bowls, spoons and ladles, those were some of the things made for women. A husband would make sure his wife had implements for everyday living. He made sure she didn't go without. Crafts weren't made for money back then. Everything was made for the family's use. Those people were like that, those that we saw, the first generation. They weren't rich. They lived in difficult ways. Things weren't easy for those elders. As they talk, the individual masks take shape. Nick Charles curves the face of a famous shaman, the man said to have predicted the coming of the white man. Kay Hendrickson carves a seal mask, and Uncle John shapes the face of the snowy owl. Although these men have carved many wall masks hanging now in museums and private collections, this is a far older art. It calls on long-held memories of how to shape the carving to a human face, light enough to wear and open enough to breathe through. That's achieved by hollowing the mask out, trying it on, and trimming until the feel is just right. Then comes the detail that makes all the difference, the carving of the eyes. 
To cut holes for human eyes is to give the mask a life and purpose that no wall decoration can have. The face is that of a dream. The eyes are its spirit. Each mask is also equipped with mouthpieces, small pegs that the dancer can grip with his teeth. In the old days, this was said to be a trick of the shaman to make it appear that the mask stuck to his face by magic. The final touches are now added to the masks. The owl is provided with ingenious breathing holes augured into the corners of its beak. Some of the fine detail of the face will be hidden by paint. Most will never be seen by the audience. Nonetheless, it is there. As the masks take shape, the Bethel dancers prepare to perform their stories. This, too, is traditional. In the old days, dances were full-scale performances, carefully thought out and thoroughly rehearsed. Now, as in the past, the old songs must be recalled and the complex motions taught to the dancers. Yupik dance, like the Yupit themselves, has evolved into something unique in the Inuit world. Its styles and conventions set it apart from the dancing of other Eskimo peoples, such as the Inupiat to the north. Men almost always sit or kneel when they dance. Women stand. Men dance with fans of stiff bird feathers, women with fans of reindeer hair. Men sing the songs as they keep time with great hoop drums. The Bethel dancers have much to prepare. In addition to the songs that accompany the three masks, they'll perform six other dances, including the traditional welcome, the wand dance. While the dancers practice, the carvers are putting the finishing touches on the masks. That includes a characteristic feature that's traditional in much of the Yupik world, a hoop of bent spruce to represent Tha, the universe. In the old days, a mask might be ringed with as many as five of these hoops, said to represent the upper worlds of the air. These were the worlds visited by the shaman in magic journeys that were later related in songs and dance. The hoop is made from a long strip of spruce shaved smooth and even by the curved knife. In the old days, it would be steamed, but hot water works just as well. The carver bites the wood to soften it as it bends to a perfect circle. The ends of the hoop are fitted and tied to hold the shape as it dries. The hoop projects from the mask on spokes fitted at the corners so it will seem to float and halo the face. <coughs> Next come the attachments that will surround the hoop. They may be parts of the creature portrayed by the mask like the feet and wings of Uncle John's owl. Or they may be elements in the story told by the masks like the kayak, paddle and ice hook that surround K. Hendrickson's seal. Nick Charles carves a different sort of attachment, the magical ship seen in the vision of the shaman Isi Sayuk. Eskimo dance masks are made for dramatic effect as well as symbolic value. In the old days, many were decorated with manes of reindeer hair or feathers, tufts of tundra cotton and dangling pendants of wood. The pieces were designed to move as the dancer moved, adding to the spectacle and the excitement in the dimly lighted kazik. The carvers attach their pieces with springy bird quills so that they quiver as the dancers move. Next, the carvers paint their masks with traditional pigments, clay and mineral colors obtained from nearby Nelson Island. The white is a mixture of clay and water soaked into the wood and fire dried in the flame of a gas stove. The red and brown are made from ochre, an oxide of iron. In the old days, these colors were valuable trade items in other parts of the region, and artists kept their paints in intricately carved wooden boxes. The black is India ink, replacing the ash or graphite used in the past. When the masks are thoroughly dry, it's time to lash on the symbolic hoop and attach the appendages. 
Small holes are augured into the hoop to receive the bird quill attachments, which are then glued into place. Nick Charles remembers when the glue was homemade. It was made with blood. When they didn't have animal blood, they'd make their noses bleed and use that. You rub it until it turns white, and it makes a strong glue. At last, the three finished masks hang on the wall, ready to tell their stories. Uncle John's owl is surrounded by its parts, feet, wings, and a feather, and by the creatures that provide its food, a vole and a willow ptarmigan. Kay Hendrickson's seal is surrounded by the gear used in the hunt. Nick Charles' shaman is crowned by the magic ship, its sides painted with the large-eyed half-faces that figure in the story of Isi Sayuk's prophecy. It's time for the dress rehearsal. Before the masks are worn, though, Nick Charles explains each one to the dancers, relating its story and pointing out the various parts. The masks will be worn by Joe Chief Jr., a young dancer who began learning the art as a child. The effects of the masks is electrifying. Their return and the return of the songs that go with them has inspired the dancers and their apprentices to revive some of the other traditions that have fallen from use. By the night of the performance, the local high school gymnasium has been transformed into the memory of a great qaziq. In the center of the room hangs a web of twine and feathers radiating outward. It's called tlangwak, a Yupik word that means a likeness of the air, the sky, or the universe. In its center floats a fur-clad effigy of tlangwamyo, the person or child of Tla. Tlangwa Mio and the web of the universe are designed to move with the beat of the drum, to come alive with the music. The first dance is a descriptive one. A bear makes his way along the seashore on the incoming tide, angry as he wets his feet in the surf. He paws the sand in his frustration. The next dance is the traditional welcome, the wand dance. It's often performed by men wearing women's headdresses and beads, keeping time with dance sticks adorned with feathers and tufts of down. Before the song of Isi Saik is performed, Nick Charles tells his story. <laughs> This is a mask that the dancers wanted. Before the white men came, when all the people here were Yupik, a man with the name Isi Sayuk directed the carvers to make a mask like this one. On its forehead was a sailing ship, and though they had never seen such a thing, they carved it as he described. It had two masts, and on a platform between them, there were the figures of two men. We made only one man on this mask because of our impatience. The following summer, a ship exactly like the carving arrived from the sea. On its sides were images of half-human faces. You see, Saib advised the people not to go out to the ship or to trade for the goods it brought. He forbade his family to buy the goods because he said they would be useless. Nonetheless, the people continued to trade for the goods until one day a man went out and noticed that the eyes on the side of the ship were turning toward the sea. The ship sailed away and all the trade goods that the people acquired soon disappeared. You see, Sayuk's own daughter cried for a necklace that she had seen on the ship. Seeing that she would not be comforted, Isi Saik directed his wife to spread the skin on the ground outside. When she did so, it began to hail. 
the hail that fell on the ground melted, but that which fell on the skin did not. They brought the hail into the Qazgik and made a necklace for the daughter. The ornament didn't last for long, but the following summer a real ship came to the mouth of the Kaskukun, just as you see Sayyid prophesied. That was considered to be the first time white people came to this place. For centuries, the seal has been the staff of life for the people of the coast, the source of food and clothing, as well as the light and heat provided by its rich oil. This dance celebrates the seal hunt, a complex and dangerous undertaking. It wasn't easy. They didn't hunt with these modern boats, these outboard motors, only with the kayak and a paddle like this. They hunted with harpoons, no guns. The size hook was a very important tool for its survival. When you traveled by kayak, you were told to take it with you at all times. If you were to fall into a snow-covered crevasse, this hook could break your fall and help you to climb out. The flat part at the end serves as a shovel, and the other end is used as an ice pick. This wooden hat was worn when traveling in rough seas. They'd put on waterproof parkas made of seal gut and tie the bottoms tightly around the opening of the kayak. The hat then serves as an umbrella, allowing you to breathe when a wall of water washes over you. Because the seal eats fish, they're also included in this mask as decorations. The owl dance tells the story of a mother owl and her fretful children. She tries to quiet them with a song about their father, who will soon be home with mice and ptarmigan for their supper. Failing to calm them with a song, she rocks them. When that doesn't work, she resorts to a spanking. In the old days, these masks, having played their parts, would have been thrown away or given to children as playthings. Their magic would have departed along with the songs, the stories, the feelings of wonder in the Qazgik. But this is a magic that grows. It is the magic of powerful memories recalled, of traditions that take on new meaning. The Bethel dancers will keep the masks well for the next dance and the next. The eyes have been restored, and with them, a vision of the past, a glimpse of the future. <laughs>